You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. In today's show, you're going to be hearing from gold stock fund manager and Austrian economist, Larry Lepard of Equity Management Associates. His website is EMA, the number two dot com. Larry just completed another stellar year in his fund. So we're going to be hearing about that and how he's positioning his fund for 2021. Larry, welcome back onto the show. Thanks for having me on, Bill. It's always fun to be with you. Um, this one is going to be more about names and mining stocks than macro. I've done a lot of talking on the web recently and saying the same thing over and over again. So try and get a little more into the names, picking companies, analyzing companies, how I do that. Excellent. So let, let's talk about last year before we talk about 2021. What did your fund do and what were some of your high flying performers? Yeah. So the fund was up 126.2% on the year. Uh, which obviously I'm pretty pleased with. Um, you know, it, it, the, there were a lot of high flying performers. I'd have to go back to my Q3 report to look at it. And if you got my Q3 report, in fact, I might have it here. I can list off, um, yeah, I'll list off a few names. But, you know, early stage drill stories actually did incredibly well during this year. I mean, we had, you know, I'll give you some examples here. This is my Q3 report. You know, Arcana up. 285%, Banyan up 800%, Benchmark up 400, BlackRock up 600, Cabral up 350, Chesser up 300, Discovery Metals up 400, Lion One up 400. Of course, it's come back, but it's a buy right now. Monarca Minerals up a lot, Telson up a lot, Vanguard up a lot, Vanguard up 700%. So, you know, and and don't get me wrong, it's not like I have big positions in those drill stories. I mean, to you know, to step back a minute for those who aren't familiar with the way I do this. Um, I have three buckets that I uh, look at. I look at producers um, and I try and find growing producers at low cash flow multiples. So you have three ways to make money. It's price of gold goes up, production goes up, multiple expands. So that's bucket number one. That's about a third of the portfolio most of the time. Um, biggest name there that I've always liked for a long time. It's getting bought, but it's still something you could buy is Taranga. And, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of nice names in there, some of which trade at very low cash flow multiples like Step, which I've talked about on the web in the past. Um, you know, selling at roughly three times run rate cash flow and cash flow is going to grow. Uh, second bucket is developers. These are companies that have a defined 43101 resource. They're trying to build a mine. And the risk, obviously, is in getting the financing and build a mine. I'm actually on the board of two of these, which are Amarillo and Rise. They didn't go up much last year. They're, they're in the process of de-risking their projects. And once they get those risks out of the way, they're going to go up a lot, in my view. Obviously biased. I'm a director. Um, but these are companies like Sabina and other companies that are, you know, basically on their way to being miners. Alexco is a perfect example. Um, did nicely last year, silver miner, super high grades. And, uh, you know, they're now producing, just starting to produce. So, um, you know, and the, the producers, I mean, the developers have more torque than the um, producers because, you know, they're the you're paying for the risk that they're not going to get it going right. And then the third story is drill stories, which in early cycles of a bull market when, you know, these stocks have been very badly beaten up because, Everyone was, you know, kind of horror, you know, horrified with what happened from 2011 to 2015. You know, you had just incredibly good deposits and people sitting on a project like, you know, a Cabral where they were trading at $5 an ounce in the ground, which is insane. Um, and so when people wake up and go, hey, hang on a second, there's a good deposit here. This is going to probably turn into a mine. You know, you can get three, four hundred percent up appreciation. And I had a bunch of those. But, you know, I, I, and you just see to and fl flush out where the rest of the stuff was. So it's just in general, say a third producers, a third developers, and a third drill stories. It's kind of how I balanced the fund last year. Um, and uh, and probably of the categories, the drill stories performed the best, but not all of them performed. And, you know, a big weighting for me in a drill story might be one or 2%. So, you know, um, because, you know, you get, you know, the chance to go up five to 50 X in a drill story over its cycle, but you also, you know, have the chance to go to zero. And so you got a lot of optionality, but a lot of risk. And so you can't put 10% of your portfolio in a drill story. Would never recommend that. If you're in a drill story, you got to you got to be in a number of drill stories that look good, and you try and balance it out. Um, there are some drill stories that I like now, even at today's prices. One of them is BlackRock. I've tweeted about this. Uh, another one is Lion One, which really came in a lot last year on tax loss selling in the second half of the year. And so I think it's a fabulous deposit. I think it's very cheap. And then there comes a time to exit a drill story too. I mean, I was in Great Bear at one point, but you know, it's a great deposit, good company, et cetera, but it's gotten extremely expensive. And so, 
you know, when you're six, seven hundred million dollar market cap, you know, I mean, it's 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 unusual for a drill story to grow to more than a billion dollars of market cap. So, actually, one of my big criteria in drill stories is just how cheap is it. You know, I mean, I, I you know, I tweeted just the other day about a company called Palangio, which is a drill story, and um, you know, it's a thirteen million dollar market cap and great geologist running it, woman, uh, two deposits, one of which just had some good results, another which I think has a lot of prospectivity, and hey, at thirteen million bucks doesn't take a lot of, you know, hey, we hit something to double or triple or quadruple. And so, you know, that's your drill story bucket. But, you know, guess what? People drill and, you know, they get dusters. It doesn't work. You got to watch out, even with someone as seasoned as you, though. Don't you have to watch out when you've had such a nice streak? It's easier to think you're better at this than you are, right? Well, even- that's right. Yeah, I just learned, I just Googled this, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yeah, you think, you're, you know, you think you're a genius. And that's one of the things, actually, I, I would point out. I mean, it, you know, I did well this year because I had a big macro tailwind. I mean, if we didn't, if we don't have macro tailwinds, that's why I spent a lot of time and other uh, things I've done on the web talking about the macro tailwind. And that's why I'm in this area. I mean, let's, let's not care. So mining, you know, mining minerals, you know, precious minerals, it's a tough business. It's a really tough business. And there are lots of ways to lose money and there are lots of ways to do it wrong. And, you know, kind of, you know, doing it, you know, baking your own, if you're a geo and you're in the industry and you understand how this all works, you know, I've seen guys do extremely well managing their portfolios. If you're coming to it new and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to start buying mining stocks and make a killing, you know, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Um, and you know, I've been doing it for 12 years and, you know, I, I still make mistakes, but I less than I made when I started 12 years ago. And so, um, you know, the, I would I would say there's there's an argument for, you know, being in index funds and or sticking to, you know, the least risky, you know, I, you, you got to have a portfolio, right? You got to have, you got to have some producers, that you know are just going to steadily grow, then you know. Then you want to play around with a few developers if you think they're the best of the development bucket, and then you want to play around with a few drill stories if you think they're the best of the drill story bucket. And Larry, how do you balance illiquidity in your portfolio? Because you do private placements and you're in a lot of these drill stories that are very illiquid unless they hit something. Like, how do you look at your overall portfolio? Be be you know regarding I could sell this today if I wanted it, but yeah, no, I, I keep records of that, and that's part of why I, I have all the producers. And there are times when I get a pullback, you know, I like to have the producer bucket there because they're like you know Tarang is a multi-billion-dollar market cap, and it's about a one point it was like a nine percent weighting. It's about the biggest I've ever been in any particular company. But um, you know, so I, I like it when I can sell off some of that to buy a drill story when it gets cheap again, like a Lion One. Um, so, but I but I monitor uh, how much liquidity I have, and I basically I figure I could sell um, all but forty percent of my portfolio is not really liquid. I could sell sixty percent of my portfolio probably in a few weeks without really damaging the the underlying stocks. The other forty percent I really can't sell either because I'm under a four year lockup and or I've got warrants attached and or the stock's too penetrated. So, and, you know, I'm pretty comfortable being in illiquid things right now. And I think other people can be too, because we're early in the cycle. I mean, I described one of my newsletters recently. I think we're in the second inning of this bull market. And, you know, because we're in the second inning, everything's going to go up, right? As we continue to get these macro tailwinds I talk about in other areas, I mean, we're going to have People are still in uh, Toronto. I talk to they're still saying, "Well, we're going to go back to seventeen hundred. No, we're not. I mean, not in my view. <laughs> we're going to go to twenty five hundred. Then we're going to go to three thousand. All these stocks are going to be much, much higher. Um, but having said that, as we get further on and later in the cycle, you know, you don't want to be buying illiquid things later in the cycle unless you're prepared to handle severe drawdowns. Because one, that's the other thing that's true of this space and that everyone getting into it should be aware of is that you know. Yeah, it sounds really great making 100 times, you know, 100 percent on your money or 200 or 300 percent on your money quickly. You're like, you know, I'm a genius. This is great. But, you know, Bill, you've been doing this a long time. I've been doing it a long time. You know how this works. I mean, you can also just get killed. I mean, you can have stocks put out 50 percent in a heartbeat. I mean, if you know. And you can have warrants deeply in the money. And before you know it, they're worthless. They're worthless. I mean, if you were in Northern Dynasty and, you know, the, the government denied the permit, bam, you lost 50 percent in one day. You know, same thing happened with Tao when they took took over the mine in Guatemala. So, you know, people have to understand this is really risky shit. I mean, and, and it's not easy money. Now, it's it's easy enough money in my view because we have this macro tailwind. And and you know, if you if you want to play this area and you know have what I consider to be the best risk reward profile, you look for growing producers. You know, I mean, I'll I'll mention a few. I mean, Tarang is one of them. You know, Argonaut's another one I like. Um, K92, I really like. Rocks Gold, I really like. 
We'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Silver One Resources is an exploration and development company backed by strategic investors Eric Sprott and SSR Mining. At Silver One's Candelaria Mine Project in Nevada, there is already a historic resource estimated at 127 million ounces of silver, which Silver One is developing and advancing. The company's Phoenix Silver Project, located within the Arizona Silver Belt, is an early stage exploration project on which native silver vein fragments have been discovered Near surface. One grab sample assayed an astounding 14,688 ounces per ton. Yes, that's right, ounces, not grams. Silver One has tremendous exploration potential, is extremely leveraged to the price of silver, and is cashed up and poised to increase shareholder value. Silver One trades in New York under the ticker SLVRF and in Toronto under the ticker SVE. To learn more, go to silverone.com. That's silverone.com. You mentioned some one asset producers. Does that bother you at all if if the producer only has one asset? They all have risk for sure. And one asset, you know, obviously having more assets rather than one is better. But, you know, again, none of these are more than a couple percent of my portfolio. So what you do is you, you know, you layer in, you know, a bunch of good mines with a bunch of good management teams at, a, at decent prices. And occasionally you're going to get a Tahoe or you're going to get, you know, something that's working, but just blows up. You know, I mean, that, that does happen. And, but what your protection against that, or the reason that you can invest in this area, knowing that is that, you know, you're talking about one X downside and two to five X upside. And so, you know, unless, unless you're going to get 80% of them are going to go south on you, which is pretty unlikely, you know, that model works. I mean, you're, you're just averaging it out, but yeah, you've got to be willing, you know, I mean, some people shat on K92. I remember when it was a dollar and they were saying, oh, I never invest in popping again. It's a terrible area. Well, you know, I did the research. It's not perfect, you know, and, and Porgia was obviously a shitty mine that, you know, others mismanaged. They destroyed a river and, you know, but I, you know, I did a lot of deep due diligence. I discovered that, you know, the, the mining minister actually loved K92 because they're doing it right, you know, and, and so they weren't going to mess with K92, although they're all over Barrick and the Chinese for what they did at Porgia. So, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's, you know, you just have to kind of know and understand. You got to balance it out and you got to understand, you got to look at it. I mean, I look at this really, it's it's like a it's like a, a poker game or playing, you know, it's a probabilities game, Bill. You know, um, what are the odds? You know, I mean, I never fall in love with a stock ever. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that early investors make. You ask me, you know, can you talk about some of the risks and some of the issues for newbies? You know, they tend to fall in love with a, a mining stock. You know, they look at it and say, oh my God, look at this, these are great people. And, oh my God, they, they get a double on it. They're like, holy shit, I love this thing. It's going to the moon. I completely love this thing. Oh my, it's just, and they, you know, they, they feel about it the way some other idiots feel about Tesla. You know, like this is the greatest stock ever. And, you know, no, it's not. It's just a bunch of guys trying to get some rocks out of the ground. And, you know, it may be on a roll and it may be doing pretty well. And it may going to, maybe it's, you know, that. And so what you want to try and figure out is what constitutes cheap, you know, like early perspective, good people and a lot of upside room. And then what constitutes expensive, you know, and getting like fully, you know, fully up there. I mean, I'm in. You know, I'm in newfound gold up in, you know, uh, Greenland and, and, you know, I've got three or four times my money and I think it's a fabulous deposit. I think it's going to get more valuable, but would I buy it fresh here? I'm not so sure. You know, I mean, it, it's, you know, I mean, take, take West Dome and, and Carson so Lake. What is your ex exit strategy on Newfoundland? Because at what point does your downside become, your potential downside become greater than your potential upside? Because like you said, they're, they're headed towards a billion dollar market cap, but really that's kind of speculative. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, I, you know, uh, not to, you know, show too many cards, but at some point I'll be slowly but surely selling it off. I mean, not, you know, maybe not all the way down. You know, again, that's the other thing with a lot of these stocks. I mean, you know, your decisions don't have to be binary. They don't have to be ones and zeros. You know, I mean, um, I've sold some K92 along the way. Hell, it was up, you know, eight or nine times. So it wasn't hard to do, you know, to sell a little off. I mean, you, you know, you, you adjust your weights based on what you think you've got and based on, you know, I mean, is, is Newfound, you know, Newfound has been, say, say for me, it's been a four-bagger so far, right? Is it going to be a four-bagger from here? Eh, quickly? Not likely, you know. So, so you know, at some point, I'll begin to sell it. But am I going to dump it all right now? No, because I think it's got a bit longer to run. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm always kind of looking at how much, how far do they have to run? You know, how, you know, how much, how much of it should it's built in to the price? I mean, I own Kirkland Lake on the run-up. I own, you know, Westham on the run-up. I don't own either one right now. You know, if I were to buy one of those, I'd probably buy Kirkland Lake. But, you know, just because they're very fully priced. 
And, you know, my job for my investors, I'm trying to get them alpha, which is I'm trying to get them torque. And that's, that's how I'm generating these kinds of returns. What about hedging? How are, how might you hedge this coming year? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't really short gold stocks. Sometimes I short the indices if I think we're going to um, have a correction. As, you're, as everyone's probably aware, the, the math on short selling stinks compared to the math on being long. It's just, it's hard to make money as a short seller. There aren't any rich short sellers. What about going long volatility as a means to short? That wouldn't, I've thought about that and that wouldn't be a bad idea. I'll tell you what I do, and this is part of what generates the returns as well. Um, you know, it, it um, when we're, you know, I do look at the cycles and I do look at sentiment and you know, right now, for example, I'm long a bunch of SLV call options, okay? Because, you know, one thing's for sure, I mean, we, we, had, we had a big way, and, and I can assure you that in August, I was not long a bunch of SLV call options. I wasn't brave enough to short them, but you could see the sentiment indicators, you could feel the frenzy, we'd had one hell of a run, and, you know, you just, you don't want to, so, so I was selling things and taking torque down. You know, now we've had a, a you know, almost, I mean, if you call August the peak, I mean, we're almost at the six-month Correction point, I think we are going to have another wave up here. I don't know exactly when it starts. It could be tomorrow. It could be a month and a half from now. It could be two months from now. But I'm pretty sure this year we'll get another wave up that, you know, the macro conditions indicate that. And so, you know, I'm buying a lot of silver options with torque because, you know, I think silver on the next run will, you know, easily surpass its old high. And, you know, that's, again, that's how you add you add to what you're trying to do, uh, which is, you know, get, you know, maximize your return. Larry, uh, you mentioned in your your recent letter, which I should mention, if listeners want to get your newsletter and sign up for that, I'll put a link in the show notes for that. But you talked about the, the gold producers in historical perspective relative to the gold price. Could you give a thumbnail overview of that? Because I think that was uh, quite compelling. Yeah. So the, what, what the, you know, one of the more interesting things that happened this year, Bill, the stocks went up less than the metal this year. That almost never happens. I wrote my year end report. I did the numbers. And I said, you know, gold's up 25% in calendar 2020. And stocks are up 23%. Now think about that. The gold the doesn't G- GDX specifically. GDX specifically. Exactly. You know, the gold doesn't multiply. It just sits there. So it's got absolutely zero yield. And that's, that, that price appreciation was another way of saying the dollar became less valuable in gold terms. The stocks are entities that have streams of gold coming through. It's like a bond, you know, it's going to pay you gold in the future. And, and by the way, they're not expensive. I mean, you know, five times cash flow, that's an implied yield of, you know, 20%. So, you know, the stocks are kind of a 20% yielding, you know, earnings yielding entity and gold goes up 25% and the stocks go up 23%. I mean, WTF, right? It just, it, it stunned me. And so, you know, there's a chart in my quarterly letter that, you know, the best place to, by the way, to get a lot of my thoughts and understand what I'm doing, because I tweet a lot, is to go to Twitter and follow me. It's just my name on Twitter. You'll see it. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is that the, the stocks just have very badly underperformed the metal price. And, I, you know, I beat this phrase to death, but I call this battered gold bull syndrome. I mean, everybody, I mean, Bill, you've been in a long time. I have too, you know, you know, it's, it's been a terrible business to invest in. You know, I mean, if you've been here since 2011, you've been killed, you know, and it, yeah, it got a little better in 2016. We got a nice pop, but then 17 and 18 were bad too. And so what I think is going on, people just really don't believe that there's finally going to be a bull market in gold stocks. And, you know, I think there will be when they, you know, a couple more years of they're the best performing stock that they start paying dividends or selling at low cash flow multiples. I mean, we're already seeing people come into the segment who just do quantitative screens and go, where else can you find a growing cash flow? stream that trades at 5x cash flow. I mean, no, there's no place in the market like that. So people are going to come to this. And then, of course, the, you know, the Robin Hood people are going to figure it out and it's going to go absolutely nutty. So, so I mean, you just can wait of, till Robin Hood lets them buy in the OTC. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, you just, you just, you can kind of see where it's going. And that's why I say, I, you know, I, I mean, maybe we're in the third inning, but we're still, we're still kind of early days. And I actually think, you know, so people look at my numbers, they say, well, you had a couple of good years, you, you can't continue. In fact, I've had some investors say, gosh, I'm really, you know, I'm so happy I got to take some out because you just can't, you can't keep going this well. And I'm kind of like, no, this is, this is kind of the way this thing works. I mean, there, there are periods where it doesn't work at all. And then when it does work, it works incredibly well. And, you know, and that's, that's partly due to the operating leverage. I mean, you know, a company might make $1,000 at $2,000 gold because their ASIC is 1000 and so they've got a thousand of profit. Well, you go to three thousand dollar gold. So you know, which is obviously a thirty three percent increase from two. 
but or, or higher, but but you, you go up to three thousand dollar gold and fifty percent increase, and and you you know you've got um, you know you, you, your profits have doubled. So so there's a lot of leverage in the higher gold prices in the earnings power of these businesses, and and I just don't think the market sees it. And I mean, I it's you know. Uh, for me, and obviously I'm talking my book and, you know, I, I don't like these guys who pump and dump and everything else, but I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm pounding the table. You know, this, I like this setup. I really, really like the setup. Now, you know, I could be wrong. I've talked about that in my letter too. I mean, if we get, you know, government cutbacks and negative or positive real interest rates, then gold isn't going to continue to go up the way it has been. But, you know, if we look at who won the election and we look at what they're talking about and signaling, I just don't see how the government ever, you know, walks away. You know, we look at the pandemic, we look at the pain that people are suffering and their, their desire to help them with that. I just don't think the government can walk away from what it's kind of committing you know, in the process of committing to do, which means more money printing, which means more people saying, you know, this is my macro stuff saying they got to come over to a sound money alternative. I mean, again, the letter talks about $400 trillion of financial assets. There's call it $4 trillion of what we call sound money stuff you know, gold, gold stocks, Bitcoin. And so, Larry, you, know, you made a lot of money in the tech bubble, right? If I recall. Yeah, I did. I was fortunate there. I, so before I did this, I got into this in 08. And before I did this, um, I was a venture capitalist from uh, late 70s to, you know, 1980-ish kind of to, uh, to 2003. And all I was investing in private companies, uh, technology companies. I mean, we're starting off with the IBM PC in 81. I didn't invest in that, but I invested in things around that. And it just kind of continued on. And what really, you know, the highlight of my career where I got luckiest was in uh, oh, uh, 2000, what am I thinking about? Sorry, 1993, the guy gave me a, um, a business card that had an internet address, said, send, send that material to my internet address. I said, what the hell is that? <laughs> said, well, it's on CompuServe. You got to dial up, have a modem, blah, blah, blah. I, said, I went back to my office. I told my guys, I said, man, that's powerful. We got to get into that. And we did. And we went and we bought every private internet company we could. And of course, that worked really well. But, you know, just like what I think is going to happen with gold, you know, it went on to become a bubble and I retired in 2004 and, you know, I was raising my family and my kids and 2008 rolled around. I was like, oh, I know what this means. They're going to debase the currency. So I jumped into gold and um, and it worked great for about three years. And then I looked like the biggest moron on the planet from about 2011 to 2016. And, and uh, you know, I mean, my results were absolutely dreadful and it was an extremely humbling experience. But I, you know, I kept analyzing it and I knew that fundamentally there was, you know, that this issue was going to arise again and that eventually, you know, I would be right. Although I must tell you, it was really hard. And there were a lot of times. Do you have the same confidence now or greater confidence in how you're positioned in the gold stocks relative to the internet companies back then? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is the pound. That's everything. This is one of the most asymmetric trades I've ever seen. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I, I have the exact same confidence and I made a lot of money betting on the internet in 93. I, I've got as much or more confidence in this trade now. But again, I want to, I want to caution, you know, I had that same confidence in 08 <laughs> and I was wrong. Okay. So, you know, I could be wrong again. I mean, they could pull a rabbit out of their hat. I mean, the other side did a very good job in 08. I mean, I think there are a lot of reasons this is different. It's at a sovereign level, not the, you know, not, not the banks and financial level. They plug the holes. You know, they did Operation Twist to hide inflation. I mean, they did a lot of devious shit, you know, to, to screw us up. Um, and they managed to extend it and get another credit cycle going. But, you know, now it's at the sovereign level. I don't know who, you know, I don't know what higher level they get to. And every time in the past, historically, that you've had this kind of a sovereign debt level compared to the GDP, you know, there's either been a, a depression, a collapse or restructuring like FDR did or massive inflation like what we did after World War II. So, so I'm pretty damn sure about it. But um, you know, I caution because I caution you because if you had been talking to me in 28 or nine or 10 or 11, you know, I'd have told you I was pretty damn sure about it then too. And I, I was dead ass wrong. And I watched a lot of that money I made in that internet. I, you know, I, I lost a lot of it. I gave a good piece of it back, but, um, you know, but it's not over yet. <laughs> and at the peak of this gold stock bubble, that's your second retirement then? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, you know, it, it's, um, Look, I, you know, I'm fine. I've been very lucky, but um, I, you know, I, I think that I think that people who invest in this area will be rewarded if they understand it and they stay with it. I think they will be rewarded for taking this risk at this time. Um, you know, I, I would, you know, there will, and, and to me, doing what I'm doing right now feels very easy and right because I know we have a real run coming here in the gold stocks, and I feel like I'm buying them cheap. I mean, 
I, I, I do worry a bit out when, you know, they're going to become frothy. You know, they're going to become expensive and it's the price is going to have future gold price advances built into it. And, you know, then the powers that be figure out some way to get gold under control. Well, guess what? You know, it could be some real heartache for gold stock investors. So, you know, I, I feel pretty, you know, I'm a pound the table guy right now, but that doesn't mean this is a, you know, this is a forever trade. And I think that's a key point you bring up that for newer speculators, you always got to assess how much speculation and forward projection is built into the stock, right? Right, exactly. And I can I can say I still, you know, when you look at that chart in my report, where you, you look at the price of the gold, you know, the index to the metal, we're still way, way, way on that. There's not a lot of speculation, if any, in this area. The mainstream has not figured it out. You know, the, the I mean, if, if you're if you're in here right now buying gold stocks, you're a very early adopter, in my view. I mean, this is 1994 or five in the internet, you know, Netscape just went public. I mean, it's, you know, we've broken out and, and we're about to get a real run, but you'll also remember from that instance, and this is an interesting comparison in 1998, I thought it was all over in the summer of 80, 1998, LTCM blew up, you know, and, and all the tech stocks just got crushed, just absolutely crushed. And I thought, okay, this is it. It's all over. And of course, no, they came in and put it all back together and, and then it got really nutty in 99 and 2000 before it ended. And so, you know, you gotta, I think we've got to assume this market's gonna kind of unfold in a similar fashion. And I actually think we're, I actually think we're right on the cusp because what happened is, you know, we came up to 1900, went through it, 20, 80 something, right? Came back down below it, we're bouncing around. I mean, it's, this, this battle at 1900, it's gonna be a big battle. This could take a little while. I mean, it may not happen this week or next month, but it's, I'm pretty sure it's gonna happen this year. We're gonna clear that 2080 and we're gonna get in the 20, 200, 2300, then people are gonna go, oh shit, this is really a bull market. No shit, this thing is going a lot higher. And, and it's gonna become self-fulfilling, right? That, you know, and, and you know, I mean, that, at that point in time, people are in this area are gonna make a lot of money very quickly, um, yes. you know. Now, you know, then there'll be another decision to make, you know, how much of it do you continue to ride with and how much do you take off the table? But, you know, I think buying right now is not a stupid thing to do. I'm, I'm very leveraged right now. Well, thank you, Larry. Larry's website, again, is ema2.com. I'll put a link to his Twitter and his newsletter sign up in uh, the show notes. And it's, a, it's just a great macro perspective from a gold stock fund manager every time I read uh, Larry's letter. So it's very insightful. Larry, thank you for coming on today's show. Oh, thanks, Bill. It's really always fun to be with you. We've, uh, we've been through the wars together. It's, it's fun to talk to guys who get it. So thanks a lot. Take care. 